Good morning, everybody, or actually, I think it's a good afternoon now. Just crossed over. Hope you all had a nice coffee break. So yeah, I would like to start out, first of all, by saying welcome. Uh, thanks for coming to the IJC. Now that we've broken into our tracks, welcome to track one. Uh, you know, I th as I was sitting here this morning listening to the plenary sessions, um, I really related a bit to what, what I would kind of say is the general theme, and I think it ties into well what I'm going to discuss here. And by that I mean, you know, when we talk about systems approach or a holistic way of, of looking, and you know, as we talked about the inkjet circle and how everything is so interconnected out there, um, you know, when I think about that, our image quality system, what it does is accounts for changes in speeds and paper types and data and is constantly making corrections to maintain quality. So, you know, again, when I think of this whole circle, that's exactly what we're doing. We're accounting for all those constantly changing variables to achieve good saleable image quality um, with our IQS. So, what is our image quality system? Um, it's a critical component of every Prosper Press. And I'll explain the Prosper Press in just a minute for those who aren't familiar. Um, but it greatly contributes to the overall image quality of every document we print on every Prosper Press. And really its main purpose is to correct for errors and produce those billions of saleable images that we produce at customer sites worldwide on our Prosper Presses. Now how do we break it down? We really look at it as having two separate functions, if you will, uh, or two phases really of the functions. There's setup tasks that occur before production, and what we call runtime corrections that occur during production printing. And, and we'll review each and every one of these functions in detail uh, in just a minute. But overall, our goal is to calibrate the system as best as possible and then maintain quality during production, regardless of job type, regardless of speed, no matter what data is coming. Uh, you know, whatever file you're printing, everything on that press, we want to account and correct for all the variation that naturally occurs during inkjet production. Um, we're all inkjet people here. We understand that, you know, the whole purpose of variable data printing is everything can be different, and that can be a challenge and a struggle to account for that and run at production speeds, and that's what we do through our IQS. And again, kind of stepping back to that holistic idea, uh, you know, Kodak has a heritage of image science. You know, over 100 years of image and material science and chemistry as a company we have, but you know, specifically as it relates to the IQS, we've been experts in imaging and data processing and handling for decades, and we've leveraged that into some of the key advancements and features that are part of this IQS. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things that we've leveraged is what we call our feed-forward system, which I'll describe in detail. But we basically, that's the first time we leverage some of this image processing into real-time corrections that are actually being made during the printing process. And so if you look at the Prosper Press here at the bottom, again, just as a quick overview for those who aren't familiar, it's a digital inkjet production press, runs a web of about 25 and a half inches wide of paper. What we do is we print cyanomagenta, we have a dryer, we print yellow, we have two dryers, and then we print black. And that's important. And why is that important? It's because we aren't just printing, printing, printing wet on wet. We're actually printing and then drying. And that intro introduces some further strain into the paper. We're now drying where the water was, so we're going to start expanding and shrinking as we go through the process of laying down each color. And so what we originally had is what we would call feedback corrections. The initial um, released IQS was a module after the last print station after black on both towers that has cameras uh, that measure and correct and, and calculate all the data for the corrections that go as we continue printing to correct for color to color registration um, and some other features that, that we'll discuss. But what we did, again going back, back to that feed forward concept, is now actually measuring and correcting before we print black. Um, and so what that did was actually use data of what was just printed to predict what's about to happen before we print black and pre-correct it in order to further reduce color-to-color -color registration errors, especially, um, you know, an asymmetric ink loading. So think, you know, heavy coverage on one side of the page, light coverage on the other. Again, we're putting a bunch of water on paper, basically, that's going to start steering the web. And so we're measuring and correcting for that before we actually print it, which further reduced our color-to-color -color registration because, as you should all be aware, on an inkjet press, what you print in a, in a web press, what you printed on the page before and what you're going to print on the page after is affecting the web as it moves through the press. And so we're correcting for that um, throughout the process. From a hardware standpoint, what does it look like? 
Um, it's pretty simple. We just have a rail with two cameras mounted. Um, they both traverse across the full width of the web, fully automated um, with an encoder, so with an alignment target that as part of the initial setup and power on process of this IQS, of the camera system, finds the home position of those cameras. And once we know the home position through the encoder, we can precisely move the camera to any point across the web. Um, it's important to note that the IQS is in no way physically aligned to any of the print heads or line heads, as, as we call them, in the system. And so what we actually do is we have to print a specific jet and measure it and find it with the cameras in order to find a datum in the system from which everything else is aligned to. Um, once we have that datum, we know exactly how far to move the cameras because of the encoder rail to find any specific jet location uh, anywhere in the press in any of the four colors on either tower. So we have six functions of the image quality system overall in two phases. So first we have registration setup. That is how we actually find that datum uh, at the very beginning. It's the first step. Then we have stitching. Um, I think everybody here is pretty familiar with the idea of using multiple print heads to get a wider width across the page. Stitching is basically how we find where they overlap and correct for that in order to produce seamless print across those stitch regions. Density calibration is just in each of those modules as we go across the width of the web, adjusting each print head in order to get a uniform density. And then we have color to color registration, which seems relatively self-explanatory, but when I get to that, I think you'll understand why it's a little more than simply aligning each color to the others. Uh, page correlation, which is making sure that the right page is printing on the front and the back at the same time. And then obviously front to back registration, making sure that the front and back are aligned both cross track and in track. And so you'll see here again that they're kind of grouped in two sections and that's on purpose because as I mentioned before, we have really two phases of the IQS. We have before and during production. So moving into registration setup, that is the first step. This is how we find that datum. And so what we're doing is we're printing a target, very simple lines that are coming off of a known jet. Um, we control the data through this target on the press. We are printing a specific jet for each color. We know what jet we're printing. That's the important part. And through that, we set the initial in-track color-to-color -color alignment. We know the delay between when cyan prints, when magenta, yellow, and so on. We know the exact time in distance and in timing when that jet is printing. That's how we get that in-track alignment. And then because we know which jet it is from a cross-track perspective, once we know, once we find that jet, that's when we, through the encoder, know exactly how to find any other jet across the web. It's a fully automated process. Um, the press operator, the only thing they have to do is click a button that says start registration setup. Um, different substrates will have slightly uh, different timings or, you know, or measurements or jet variation in terms of the in-track spacing because the substrate may stretch more or less as it runs through the system. And so we account for that through this process, automatically setting the correct timing into our controller that tells us exactly when and where we need to print every color uh, as we go through the process. Um, and it's also very slow. It only prints at 40 feet a minute, very slow, uses very little paper, fully automated to do this initial alignment. Uh, and this pattern, again, it's printed by a specific jet so we know what we're looking for. Um, the field of view of the camera itself is only about one half arcs very carefully. And so we know roughly where it should be because we know what jet is printing it. Once we find any portion of the pattern, then we center the camera over the exact position. That's how we know the exact cross track position of that jet and from there through the encoder, find the rest of the jets all the way across the full print width. Uh, and again, because different substrates will track differently through the press, we're also using this process to find where those stitch points are. So on a Prosper press, we have six jetting modules or six print heads per color. And so there's five stitch points for each color. We know where all five are as part of this process. So now we go into stitching. Again, our jetting modules are overlapped, obviously, in the cross track direction. That's why we need to stitch but ours are also staggered in the in-track direction. So there is nothing continuous about our array. It is staggered in both dimensions. And we have to account for that with our stitching process. So what we do uh, is look at a pattern, the initial pattern at the bottom that finds the exact spacing in the web direction, both in-track and cross-track, to understand exactly, basically, where 
let's take the AB stitch up here as an example. We need to know exactly where module A starts printing and module B stop, starts printing and is affected by both density and print speed. So what we do is we always calibrate stitching at production speed to eliminate speed as a variable. And now the only thing we additionally need to calibrate for is density because different tone levels being produced will result in actually different stitching. You could have a slight gap or a slight overlap if you didn't account for the tone levels. And so what we do is after initially finding those start and stop points, then we print a target across the entire density range at each stitch point that's measured by the cameras to create additional calibration or masking tables, as we call them, to understand exactly how the ink behaves on this paper at press speed across the entire density range. And we store those into tables that get loaded on the printheads themselves. And now this is the only part that's not during production, but it's really important. So what's actually happening on any Prosper Press during print production is we are constantly applying stitching calibration in real time to all the data. We're actually looking at every line coming in over the fiber optics as they come into the print head to see what tone level is at each stitch point and dynamically changing that masking based on the density of whatever raster line is, is about to be printed. So dynamically real time, all 48 jetting modules, 1,000 feet a minute, all those stitch points, we're constantly doing that to maintain consistent uniform print across all stitch regions. Finally, in, in setup is density calibration. So the goal here is simple. We just want to have a consistent density across all the jetting modules in each color, zero defects. It's a pretty simple pattern. We go and use the IQS's camera system to measure density at the stitch points for each jetting module. And then we can actually adjust for that by modifying something we call drop momentum, which functionally is basically changing the velocity of the drops themselves coming out of each inkjet head. So a slight variation in the drop velocity actually will modify our optical density as it hits the paper. And so through that slight very um, alignment, we get uniform density. And really once that's done, we have consistent density throughout printing, but it's also worth noting, you know, all Kodak Stream technology and upcoming Ultra stream technology is continuous inkjet. We're not drop on demand, we're continuous. And because of that, there are some inherent advantages to consistency, namely the fact that we recirculate all of our ink and have a fluid system that's constantly monitoring and modifying our ink concentration. That helps us with consistent color. Um, we also, because of the increased drop velocity compared to drop on demand, have very accurately placed and very round dots. So that also contributes to consistency. So you mix both of those with the fact that we do this caliper tasks and are ready to start production. But I do want to note that these can be completed at any time uh, before production. It doesn't have to be done in a specific order necessarily or you know, right before production. And, and the key there is you can really kind of speed up things. So like, let's say, just as an example, in the morning maybe you're running an uncoated paper for half a shift. Finished production, you need to move over to a high gloss stock. So you, you switch over, you, you save, basically you can save your calibration, switch over, recalibrate if needed, run production, second shift comes in, you need to go back to your uncoated stock. You can load all these calibrations we created uh, on that uncoated stock, hit a button, load, and go right back into production. So this is not necessarily, this whole setup process doesn't have to occur before every print run or anything like that. It's mostly paper that's dependent. And if you're switching back and forth between the same papers regularly, this isn't something you have to do all the time. Um, it can be recalled or saved automatically. Okay, so now we're into actual production printing. And really the key, and I'd say the core competency of what the IQS is doing is all around this color to color registration. Uh, we have a very small pattern actually. It's, it's what's over here on the sides of the slide much bigger here than in real life. In real life, it's about 13 millimeters wide, each of those patches. Very small, runs down both sides of every page, measured by the camera consistently and continuously throughout production. Um, for every job printed on every Prosper Press, on every tower, on every page, we are making five different corrections uh, on both sides of every document continuously with the IQS. So if you actually do the math and think through that of you know what our resolution is and how fast you're printing, um, at 1,000 feet a minute, we're basically providing corrections and maintaining registration for over 14 billion printed drops every second with the IQS. So then we took those basic corrections and learned a little bit from that and developed what we call document learning mode. 
And this is really impactful on jobs of multiple copies. Think books. Um, and an ed educational textbook is a great example. So it's a very lightweight paper, typically, maybe a 45 GSM lightweight coated paper. So very susceptible to water, ink on paper. You know, can easily be affected by differences in ink coverage. And again, think of a textbook where oftentimes the chapter page has a bunch of heavy coverage, bright image, and then text. So you're going heavy coverage, light coverage throughout the job. What we do with document learning mode is actually we learn the error and start pre-applying it. So the first time page one prints, we see what it did. The second time it prints, we see what it did, and so on and so on. So if we, for example, look and know that cyan on page two is going to shift to the left, because it shifted to the left before, the next time page two prints, we automatically pre-correct and shift it to the right to compensate for that. And so that's occurring on all color planes on both towers continuously when we have document learning mode enabled. So that was like a step change improvement for us in color to color registration. And then we took that and developed what I know I touched on earlier, feed forward. So we took all the learnings in document learning mode and then created feed forward to further reduce color to color error. So as we sort of talked about earlier, if you remember, we print CMYK, two dryers, and then black. This is a Prosper 6000C press here. So in the span of seven inches, we have only seven inches at full press speed, we have to measure, analyze, and correct the CMY errors that we've understood from CMY and then pre-correct black before it prints. So in seven inches, we do all that, which equates to about 35 milliseconds of time to do that at 1,000 feet a minute. And so that's the level of data we're processing and the amount of correction we're applying. And that was another step level improvement. And this was especially impactful, again, on those variable asymmetric coverage type jobs, say heavy ink on one side, light ink on the other. Because you think that by doing this, we're able to realign black perfectly on top of CM and Y uh, right before, you know, before it prints, as opposed to having to measure it after the fact and then keep trying to correct for it in advance. So this will really help illustrate exactly what five corrections we're making on every page. So to start, again, this is all automated. The entire color-to-color -color correction process is 100% automated, no user interaction required other than basically checking a box to, to turn the system on. Um, the marks themselves are automatically added through our digital front end. The operator does have the ability to control where they're placed and how frequently they repeat down the page, but that's a one-time thing. Once that's set, that information and placement is automatically sent from the DFE to our press controller and to the IQS. So functionally, when you hit go to start printing, this is all happening automatically, constantly um, behind the scenes. So at the very beginning, what are we first going to do? We're going to align colors in the in-track direction. So if you watch the screen, you'll see an animation here to kind of illustrate the center point of all colors right now are aligned, right? They're in the same in-track position. That's pretty basic. Same thing with cross-track. OK, we're going to align them all. So now x and y, the center of each, are in the same place. But we're still not registered. And so this is where it starts to become more impactful about the way that we're managing image quality with these corrections. We can also de-skew electronically. So we can actually adjust digitally the skew of any color. So from a rotational standpoint, we're aligned. But you can see we're still not aligned here. And, and it makes complete sense if you know anything about inkjet. You know we're going to put water on paper and dry. And in our case, we're going to put water down and then dry and then water and then dry again and then water and dry again. And of course, I keep saying water. Ink is mostly water. So we're affecting the paper fibers. And what's occurring here is the paper itself is usually getting narrower as we go through the press. So if your data came in, and it probably was the exact same size on C, M, Y, and K, the reality is what you're printing on isn't the same size by the time it comes out of the press. And it changes as it goes through the press. And so we can also digitally magnify our data in both directions to account for that. So first of all, we can go in the in-track direction. And magnify means we can both expand, as we just saw here. And now you can look cross-track. We can actually magnify in a reduction scenario. And so we've taken all four color planes and matched them to be the same effective width on top of each other because the paper has changed width a little bit as it went through the press. So all five of these corrections are occurring real time, constantly on the Prosper Press. So you know, again, if you think back to the beginning of this slide, when I said 
just because that crosshair, the center of that crosshair is aligned, the only way to truly be fully registered is when every color is printing not just on top of each other, but you have the same skew and the same magnification. And we're correcting for all five of those variables with the IQS. Um, and just to be clear, you know, we do not destroy data. We basically can dynamically insert or remove pixels selectively to achieve that magnification uh, as we go through the press. Finally, front to back registration and page correlation. Uh, obviously, front to back need to be aligned. That's pretty self-explanatory. We can do it both in in-track and the cross-track direction. Uh, but it is worth noting, you'll see over on the right, this is the same mark set you saw on the previous slide. All of these corrections, all three of these runtime corrections are occurring from a single mark set. Um, so these same marks running down the side, that's the only thing we are using to make all five color color corrections, to align front to back, and to do page correlation, which is verifying that CMYNK, the all color planes, are actually printing the right page at the right time. And that's critical for data integrity, right? Think of a credit card statement. You don't want the address on the front to be yours and somebody else's statements, you know, transactions to be on the back of the statement. So we are verifying for each color plane all the time that front matches back as intended in the original file. So to sum everything up, the IQS you know, really is critical for us in achieving overall image quality and producing saleable images every year worldwide. And when I hear saleable, you know, that leads to, I heard a comment made earlier about you know, going for the absolute best 10% versus you know, well, let's just say good enough. And that is something that we very often uh, discuss you know, at Kodak. And I think that's a, real, a really critical point for everybody in the industry. Yes, we all want to get the absolute best image quality, and that's what we're all here to do, and that's you know, what we're doing through this system. But at the same time, when you talk to the end customer who's looking to make money off the press and understand the TCOP and produce, actually run production to the printer, good enough and saleable really is the key. And so that's what we're driving here, saleable quality. Uh, and again, it's a culmination of our holistic or systems approach and looking at all these variables that affect the print to quality, it is more than just DPI. Not that DPI don't matter, but you know, it's dot shape, it's dot placement accuracy, it's your screening, it's your color accuracy and your color consistency, which is especially important you know, in packaging and some other markets. And the IQS to Kodak is just one part of our inkjet circle, if you will, on the Prosper Press. We're looking at all the factors um, to adjust what we can in real-time production but there are other factors that impact image quality as well. This is just a really core component of how we manage our image quality during actual production. So if you've never seen a Prosper Press, I certainly encourage you um, to go see one. Anything that's being produced on any Prosper Press anywhere in the world is the results of the IQS. Um, that's the IQS at work every day, and it's a real workhorse, the press that is. So um, I have samples at the Kodak booth, feel free to come up to me later if you want to discuss in more detail, of course. If you want to see samples of, of actual production and everything from napkins to, of course, paper to flexible films, um, we have samples on all that have been, have been produced with the Prosper Press and with our Prosper technology. So thank you very much.